Yeah, thanks, uh, Ivana, and thank you very much, uh, Andrea, Nicolas, and Lawrence, uh, for your uh, comments and interventions. Um, so I will be moderating this um, second panel of today's event, and uh, we would like to move beyond the issues that we addressed, uh, that, that were addressed in the memo and that we just spoke about, and have a bit of a broader discussion on uh, in international investment law. Uh, to better understand the underlying problems and to brainstorm a bit about uh, possible solutions and future directions of the investment treaty regime. Um, so some of the questions that we will hopefully tackle uh, include uh, what are the asymmetries built into the current international legal regime? What purpose does international investment law have? Or what should it, or what should its purpose be? Um, is it possible to design a system that strikes a fair balance between private and public interests? Um, Nicholas already gave a, a small hint uh, about that. Um, what should the role be of domestic courts in investment disputes? And, and, and finally, also, we uh, would like to reflect a bit on recent and ongoing efforts to uh, reform the ICS regime that's currently taking place in Working Group 3 of the United Commission on International Trade Law, for example, um, or the modernization process uh, of the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, with that, um, uh, we have three very distinguished speakers on this second panel. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Lisa Johnson, uh, at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, Joint Center of the Earth Institute and Columbia Law School, and she leads CSI's work on investment law and policy. Uh, Lisa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for, for the invitation. I'm going to turn on my timer to make sure that I don't speak too long. Muted. <laughs> Does that need to mute me already? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll get to do it again. I, um, yeah, so, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm focusing on um, some issues of compensation and valuation. And I thought I would start by maybe some data to put things in context. Uh, the uh, Bickle and Alan Overy recently re released a report uh, looking at some data on, on cases and compensation and awards. And I thought I would pull out some highlights from that report so we can be on the same page kind of in terms of what's at stake. Um, so what they find is between 2017, June 2017 and May 2020, the mean amount claimed by investors stood at US $1.1 billion, but excluding the UK cases from the calculation of the awards, it shows that the mean amount in dispute in recent years has increased um, by 47% from that, th from that period, 2017 to 2020, over the previous uh, three years. So we see a rise in the amounts awarded. Um, and the amounts claimed. So the mean amount awarded to a successful investor has risen by more than 184% over that same time period. We're also seeing an increase in the amount awarded as a percentage of the amount claimed. So from 29% before 2017 to 36% over the past three years. Um, another kind of statistic that stuck out to me, there have been 16 cases from June 2017 to May 2020 in which the amount in dispute exceeded 1 billion. And the higher the amount in dispute, we're also seeing that the higher the legal and arbitration costs incurred by both investors and respondent states. And here I also wanted to highlight the role of third party funding. We see these higher value claims, these multi these multi billion dollar claims, billion dollar claims, or even kind of lesser amounts than that. These are encouraging third party funding, which also enables investors to kind of spend more money in the litigation of the claims. So this facilitates spending by one side, but not the other. So we can have an impact then on both kind of the frequency of claims, the number of claims. Um, and also the, the kind of the equality of parties arbitrating those disputes. And I think more broadly in relating to the, the title of this um, workshop is that the role of third party funding, I see it as exacerbating other issues by increasing the number and power of actors that have a stake in broad interpretations of jurisdiction, broad interpretations of substantive standards of protection and broad approaches to compensation. So I think, that is something that we all need to 
to kind of be uh, paying attention to, attention to as well. Now, I wanted to um, briefly kind of highlight again, piggybacking on other people's work, because I think there's a lot of interesting thought and work on, on damages and compensation recently. We hosted a series of webinars over the past few months um, looking at some of these issues. The first was on crippling compensation, and that was based on Mar Martin's Paparinskis paper, where he looks at the rules of the, the ILC articles on, on state responsibility and finds essentially that kind of through design of those rules and then application sense, there is no protection for states against awards that will literally cripple them. Um, and so we have a rule in international law that can cripple states in compensation for ISDS. And there is nothing that states um, really can do at this point about an award such as that. And just to, to highlight some figures that I did some math on, um, for Egypt, Ecuador, Libya, Pakistan, and Venezuela, the amount awarded since 2017, so this is just since 2017 awards, um, dwarfs by multiples the average amount that EU countries spend on law courts um, as a percentage of their GDP. So if we're talking about the money that countries are spending in terms of kind of beefing up their domestic legal systems in order to provide recourse for foreign investors and all other stakeholders, this money is being channeled out to foreign investors as opposed to being spent domestically. So there's some opportunity costs, whether that's crippling or not, um, I'm not sure, but I mean, I think that that rises to, to that level. We also had George Cahale, an arbitrator, speak on kind of the practice of, of what we're seeing in terms of the cases and the kind of the arbitrary and unpredictable and really kind of excessive awards that are arising due in particular to the use of discounted cash flow methodologies, including for uh, early phase investments. Um, and then we had recently Jonathan Bonicha and Emma Asbitt present their paper where they're looking at the system of, of compensation and investment treaties is not really tackling the problems that, that many state treaties were set up to do, which is to combat opportunistic conduct by host states taken after investors kind of sunk their costs into the host state and were kind of unable to extract those investments. Um, and I think just maybe I'll stop here because I realize I'm already over time. One one thing that struck me about all of their work is that they all articulate kind of serious, real issues um, that are particularly intractable, that states now have a very hard time getting out of. Um, and so I think it brings us to the reform discussion that maybe we can come to later. But um, it's, a, it's kind of finding a solution to these challenges outside of exit from a system, I think is, is daunting. Um, so yeah, maybe we can turn to, to that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thanks for the time and the invitation. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much uh, also for the uh, very interesting uh, and, and staggering uh, statistics that shared. Um, I'd now like to turn to our next speaker, uh, Rob House. Uh, Rob House is a um, uh, Lloyd C. Nelson Professor of International Law at the New York University School of Law. Professor House is a distinguished scholar in the field of e international economic law, and he has wide experience in, in world trade law and international investment law. He is a frequent consultant to government agencies and international organizations, uh, and he was a consultant to the investors legal team in many of the early NAFTA disputes, especially those that read to judicially uh, right to regulate into the NAFTA investment chapter. Uh, please, Rob, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so um, it's great to be here and um, among um, uh, such illustrious and in many instances familiar and, and friendly colleagues. Uh, I should just ask, please remind me how many minutes I'm supposed to speak for? Five. Five. So, so one of the fundamental issues, if not the fundamental issue that's already, I think, been indirectly raised um, is um, whether or not uh, one should uh, make uh, efforts to or put one's chips in with uh, various uh, initiatives to uh, quote unquote reform uh, the investment regime and particularly ISDS that range from uh, you know, the 
bilateral court system in CETA to um, the um, uncitral negotiations to a range of what might be called statutory solutions to um, the uh, problems that have arisen with uh, really, as some have pointed out, outrageous uh, awards against states engaging in perfectly legitimate regulatory activity and at levels of compensation unheard of in domestic uh, legal systems. Um, and, you know, the right to regulate in CETA in the um, joint interpretive instrument is one effort to rein this in. Uh, provisions that limit uh, direct, um, limit a uh, compensation for expropriation to direct expropriation or severely uh, restrict um, the possibility of finding that regulatory measures constitute expropriations. Another example, um, India's uh, model BIT has a public policy exceptions provision, which is kind of a more developed version of that which one finds in the GATT and certain other uh, treaties within the WTO. And basically all these efforts are really um, uh, attempts to bring um, arbitrators um, in line. Um, or to uh, move to, uh, to use an expression Nicholas used in the first part, a different um, legal culture. Um, so uh, I think that most of the, the so-called, uh, or I would call them statutory or, tr or substantive treaty reform efforts um, are going to be insufficient as long as we have the current um, arbitrator culture, the domination um, of the investment regime by a clique of profiteers and um, the prospect of uh, huge uh, fees um, dominating uh, the approach to, um, uh, to litigation as well as um, the attitudes of, um, of arbitrators. So in, in that sense, um, to my mind, if one could really move to a judicial system um, that completely cancels um, the existing arbitral culture, um, that would perhaps take care of a lot of the problem. Um, serious public law judges would have never um, issued the kinds of uh, awards that trample on domestic regulatory uh, sovereignty and, and give multinational corporations um, damages payouts um, unprecedented in uh, domestic legal systems. So, you know, the question uh, that's been raised by skeptics uh, of the investment court proposal in Europe is whether in fact it suggests a genuine intention to cancel arbitral culture or rather it's just going to repackage it or reproduce it um, in a different setting or some other kind of pathology of legal culture that will favor corporations and um, uh, harm uh, states and citizens. And, you know, I, I, I guess I'm still uh, open to the possibility that moving to a judicial system could lead to cancellation of uh, arbitral culture, which is what we really need. Um, but, you know, the verdict is out. These are judgments of politics and sociology, as well as, um, you know, ones of, of legal dra uh, drafting or interpretation of legal, of legal texts. But, I, but uh, I fully endorse the efforts of countries like South Africa at the same time to simply move away entirely uh, from the investment regime. As has been said, um, there's no proof that it actually incentivizes investment after a couple of decades of studies by economists using a, a, a fair variety of different methodologies, the results are, you know, are, are simply that there's no robust evidence that investment, much less socially desirable investment, because not all foreign investment is socially desirable, is actually being in any meaningful way incentivized by these you know, agreements. So it's a little bit like finding out that a particular uh, medical invention has all these terrible side effects, and then uh, you know trying again and again to to 
to prove that it actually has some positive clinical effects and the side effects keep adding up uh, on the negative side of the ledger and, and, and the studies keep adding up uh, that say, you know, that there's no, um, there's no therapeutic value. So only, only a fool would take that medication, right? And I, I feel uh, that, that way about the investment regime. Subject to one caveat, which is where I'll end, which is, I think, uh, goes to, I believe it was Nicola who made this um, a suggestion, you know, the value of having international justice in relation to matters such as global investment. And perhaps I'm too much of an old WTO hound not to think of that as something that's valuable, not on the present terms, but on, on different terms uh, that would reflect you know, concerns such as non-discrimination and transparency, rather than compensating investors uh, for, uh, for regulatory change. But what I do think is that if any such system were to be developed, such as within the auspices of the WTO or UNTAD, if, if there's a right of action for investors, there has to be a right of action for other stakeholders um, as well. And, and earlier, I think it might have been Ivana who alluded to the notion that uh, we uh, are spreading the rule of law through uh, giving investors rights to, you know, to sue uh, governments. But what kind of system uh, of the rule of law is it that only gives a right of action, a right of redress to corporations and not to any other stakeholder um, who is um, impacted or affected by a dispute that involves uh, transboundary investment. So I would like to see such a system develop in WTO or, or UNCITRAL, but it has to be one that genuinely uh, supports the idea of the rule of law, which has to include an idea of equality before the law rather than special privileges and, and rights for multinational corporations. Okay, great. Thank you very much for these uh, very uh, interesting insights. Uh, um, I now would like to turn to our uh, third and last speaker um, of the panel, um, Alessandra Akuri. Uh, Alessandra is a full professor of inclusive global law and governance at the Department of International and European Law at the uh, Erasmus School of Law. Uh, and her research focuses on international economic law and the relationship with human rights and em environmental law, global governance of risks and the emergence of global technocracy. And she's also a member of the Erasmus Initiative on Inclusive Prosperity. Uh, please, Alessandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Batya. Thanks, uh, Ivana, uh, for this invitation. I'm really honored uh, uh, humble to uh, uh, be part of this conversation and also uh, let me congratulate the students and the teacher for their amazing work. I really find it uh, uh, impressive. So um, I was asked to talk uh, of participation of third parties and let me start by disappointing those who think I'm going to speak about Amigos Brief and the like. I will not because while important I think that this type of participation uh, uh, is more of a cosmetics on a monster. And I will instead focus on the obscene exclusion of the people from ISDS. So what uh, I will just continue uh, Bob conversation and make uh, just one point in the next five minutes. Nothing short of granting enforceable rights to local communities can fix ISDS. So, and by this, I mean that local people should be able to independently so not just join a dispute, but independently initiate the dispute before an arbitration tribunal uh, to defend the rights when this would be violated by foreign investors with or without the collusion of state authorities. And to operationalize such plan together with other colleagues at the Erasmus School of Law, we have also drafted some clauses which could be added to the existing bits. Uh, and I'm happy to see the reference, uh, they are available online at the UN Forum for Business and Human Rights otherwise. So let me explain why I argue that to make the system fair, it is necessary, albeit not sufficient, eh? and the not sufficient links very well to Lisa Johnson's uh, uh, speech before, uh, is uh, a necessary condition to reform ISDS is to entrust the people with enforceable rights. 
So let's go back in time. It was 1997 when a truck driver transporting waste from California to Hermosillo, a Mexican city near the US-Mexican border was injured by the toxic materials he was transporting. It is through this accident uh, that the inhabitants of Hermosillo came to learn of the toxic dump site that started uh, to operate in their backyard. And for those who work on extractive industry, we know that truck drivers are the contemporary mine canary. But this thing aside, uh, um, the people uh, uh, started to mobilize, protest uh, the corrupt public authorities that tolerated and allowed multiple violations of environmental laws uh, while uh, operating this waste site. Many of you have recognized the case, uh, which is the famous or infamous TechMed. And most of you know how the story unfolded. So the Mexican government, under much pressure, asserted the violations of the conditions of the permit to operate uh, the site. Um, and they decided not to renew the permit. From this lack of renewal, the well-known ISDS TechMed case started and the tribunal found in favor of Mexico, among other reasons, because in its opinion, the decision of Mexico was driven by socio-political reasons. The problem is that is exactly in this socio-political realm, which is anathema to the neoliberal establishment, that public knowledge is produced and the public interest is defended. And in the specific case, it was the local communities to first find out that the Spanish company was violating the conditions of the permit. For instance, by treating unauthorized liquid, biological infectious waste, and so on and so forth. That the Mexican public authorities later asserted the company's multiple violation was arguably due to the protest of the local communities. And I want to emphasize and clarify that this dynamic by which key information about the environment is produced in the realm of the social political is normal. So corporations often conceal information about the consequences, the negative consequences of their activities on public health and the environment, brilliantly documented in the book Merchants of Doubts. So uh, this is something normal. Uh, what is uh, often stigmatized as the social political is a very rational realm where information, uh, which is interesting to some and less to others, is produced. So uh, let me also uh, go back to a point that uh, Nicholas was making, uh, realizing that there is openness in the rule, such as property rights. In the system, excluding one set of actors from the conversation on interpretation of this rule is also naturally going to privilege a certain perspective. And here is my main point. The international investment regime has been designed so that investment activities can be divorced from the society where they operate. And this is the original scene of the system. It is highly problematic or just a neoliberalist at its purest to have a system which on the one hand guarantees minimum standards of treatment to protect investors and on the other hand doesn't set minimum standards of conduct for investors and we know that investors have thrived on these double standards now i mentioned the other horrible case the texaco chevron texaco chevron case where texaco chevron extracted oil in the ecuadorian amazon using technologies that at the time were outlawed in the us and then use all means to evade accountability, even in New York fora, for arguably one of the most traumatic cases of oil pollution in history, having devastated the Amazon forest. So in short, what we need is a system that puts on equal footing what is now business and human rights with investment rights. If we are serious about sustainable investments, then we should ensure that investors can be held to account and to universal, so to speak, minimum standards. And the only way to do so in my way is to entrust, uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my opinion, is to entrust local communities with equally strong rights, which are equally enforceable as the right of foreign investors. And uh, I conclude, I just uh, anticipate uh, a critique of the critics that says, well, this proposal does not go too far. The only uh, uh thing to do is exit the system which is fair enough 
I grant that entrusting local communities with such rights does not go far enough. Certainly, if we take into account the millionaire arbitration fees, uh, this would be unthinkable. So something would need to be done on that front. But if we think that there is a need of, for an international regime, then we need a system that uh, empowers the people, not just the investor. Uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>